It is the audio mullet, and I am Ethan Nicole, and with me is Doug Tenapel. Hello, everybody. I'm Doug Tenapel. Like Ethan said, he's telling the truth. I'll verify that. I'm Doug Tenapel. And Mike Nelson is not with us once again. Thank but he God. is with us in spirit, a uh, spirit of contempt. And uh, we have a special guest this week named uh, Mr. Frank Fleming. Frank, say hi, please, from your little closet. <laughs> hey, hi. Thanks for having me. If you've listened to the Babylon Bee podcast, you may have heard Frank before, but you also may have heard his chuckle, because I've turned his chuckle into a soundbite that we use often <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> so the, the Frank chuckle has become <laughs> part of the show. But Frank is known for more than his chuckle. He's also known for being a, well, on my list of things that I know Frank for, he's a great Twitter follow, number one. He's just like one of those guys that just drops Twitter bombs all day. And he's this coder. Like he just sits there coding and then he's like, hmm, here's a tweet I've got. And then he just tweets it and then it gets a gazillion likes and retweets and it's hilarious. And so we turned that into some amazing Babylon Bee content. Frank, I would say, is our best writer at the Babylon Bee. Frank, would you agree? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And then uh, Frank is also a writer. Um, He has written a couple books. Uh... He has a new book out called Hellbender, and an aud- and the audio book just came out. Yep. And uh, one, my favorite, personal favorite, is his book Side Quest. Um, it's like an epic, like office space meets Lord of the Rings uh, story that to me is this like analogy of like the Christian life. It's amazing. And it's hilarious. Anyway, that's my Frank plug. Frank... Uh, you're going to supply us with the, the, uh, topic today. So why don't you tell us what you want to talk about? Well, yeah, I, w- I like to talk about how, uh, people are always saying things aren't fair, but today they kind of say it like that means it's not true. And I, I mm-hmm. feel like people just don't know how to live anymore with things not being fair. And, you know, that's just, it's part of life and it, it's people just, they, they can't deal with it anymore. That's very mullety that dad used to always say, you know, life isn't fair. <laughs> yeah, life's so not that, fair, kid. That's very old-fashioned. If you go up to a kid and he's like, this isn't fair, like you're supposed to just turn all the furniture over to straighten out the world and, and the internet and make it all fair. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's a thing my kids constantly bring it up. It's like, uh, it, it, it is a typical thing. Like as soon as a kid starts to learn the uh, the whole concept, it's a constant weapon they try to use. Especially if they have siblings. He got an ice cream bar. I get an ice cream bar, blah, blah, blah. And they all want it. Everything has to be perfectly even. It, it's never it's, be, especially when you got like kids of different ages. You know, it's always going to be different for the yeah. oldest versus the youngest. You can't make things fair. But I mean, people just, it, it's like it just breaks the brain now. They don't, they, they, they think things have to be fair and they, they just can't be. Is there a, is there a sliding scale to fairness though? Like, if someone cuts in front of you in line at the grocery store or whatever, or at the theater or whatever, um, should we just shrug and say, hey, life isn't fair? Or or don't people – isn't there an expectation that we're supposed to bring some level of fairness somewhere, maybe just not into every little nook and cranny? I mean, I would let the guy cut in front of me at the grocery store. I'd go find you know, but <laughs> – Well, yeah, I feel like you know we're supposed to strive towards things being – you know, as equal as we can and, you know, everybody has as much opportunity, but it's like, do we understand that's not actually possible? Like this is, it's an ideal, but not something that's actually going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of this comes up in, you know, especially like gender stuff where it, you know, like they say, oh, like women aren't half of this. It's like, are they ever really going to be, or is that just a difference that's always going to exist? Yeah, like, so like for uh, instance, for instance, should men have to change fifty percent of the diapers? Hey, life isn't fair. <laughs> I'm not changing half these diapers. I think I change less than five percent of the diapers on all four of my kids because life. But isn't on that, fair. to actually perfectly di- divide the diaper changing perfectly in half would be very difficult. Uh, you know. The, the unfair principle that we're talking about here would be that when you're with the kid and he's pooped and he stinks and you're the one with him, then you got to change it. 
Oh, I and see. I handed him to Andrew. Well, I handed him to Andrew. I, 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 I mean, not, that normal person. You, you can just save it. You know, I mean, it lasts a while in those diapers, <laughs> and wait till the uh, the other person gets home. Yeah. Yeah, all the dads will also, uh, they also know this strategy. Oh, oh when, is when, do, do such a bad job that she'll come in and just take it over. Like mess up the tape ads, <laughs> yeah. put it on a little too tight or too loose. True. Or but you I, don't want to get yourself approved for too, oh, many, uh, too many things. One thing that really helps is uh, another thing that's not very fair is if you're out and a lot of times, a lot of times only the women's restroom has a changing pad. So it's like, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, it's true. Not very progressive. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I assume you're also you're you're probably talking a lot about the idea that women are the ones capable of reproducing and having children and have to go through that whole pregnancy thing. Well, yeah, it's like recently, which is had really a, unfair. It's really unfair for guys that want to get pregnant. Well, yeah, well, that's, that, unfair. that's unfair. You know, it, if guy really wants to get pregnant, not going to happen. Um, and then you know, it, it's like this came up a lot with like uh, Elizabeth Warren claimed she lost her job from uh, pregnancy, but you know, there's definitely pregnancy discrimination. And that's one of those things where it's not fair. A woman gets pregnant. She's going to maybe have to stay out of the job for a few months. And, you know, we want to treat that like it's equal, but it's not really, because I mean, that's something a business is always going to have to keep in mind. It's an expense and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's something that only affects women and it's not fair, but it's not really anybody's fault. You know, if, you know, you have an employee leave for a couple months and we want, that's, that's a problem, but our, our business is just supposed to like pretend that doesn't happen and act like it. But, and so that's probably why the discrimination still happens despite it being illegal. Yeah. It's also it not, like a, it's not fair when she goes back to work either and have some, some, someone else get paid to raise her kid and be that kid's mommy and daddy for most of the day. While she goes and serves coffee to her boss, yes, sir, no, sir. It's not fair that she gives him more respect than her own husband. Well, yeah. I mean <laughs> it's not fair. It's, it's not fair not that right. any of these women with children work. It's not fair to the kid. <laughs> well, I assume you've listened to the show, Frank, but Doug is the derailer. He'll derail at whatever you're, wherever you're going, he'll, he'll, He'll throw the track. Well, well I I'll mean, <laughs> I'll embarrass you. I, I mean, will, that, I will embarrass you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those areas where, yeah, well, yeah, you, you know, that you're stepping in a minefield, which I know you like to avoid, you know, but yeah, like yeah. stay at home moms. <laughs> I, my, my wife, you know, I, you know, I, I'm lucky enough, uh, you know, I'm able to earn for both of us. My wife can stay at home with the kids, um, but you know, it's it's a lot of times like women are kind of a, almost offended by the existence of them because it's like they're saying like, oh, you care more about your kids than me. But, you yeah. know, it's different or, circumstances. or maybe you can't even make enough money to swing the bills, but you just have va family values. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. A lot of people make sacrifices for it, which I think you know, people understand. It's not just, you know, it's coming, though, more like a rich person's luxury these days. Yeah, <laughs> I am kind of rich. Fairness is a luxury. I really think that's like the, that's the thing. I, I assume a lot of these uh, debates and whining about this kind of stuff isn't going on in third world countries. But hold on. Is it fair that there's any podcast out there that has more subs than us if they're less entertaining? Is that fair? I think you guys <laughs> got to spread the word fair. around to make the universe <laughs> more fair for this right. six foot eight snowflake. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, yeah, a lot of it's just not fair. It's just circumstances. I mean, this should be the number one podcast, but, you know, I mean, yeah. what, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit down and cry? I am. Yeah, what are you going to do? I'm going to cry. I, we should have way more subs than Jonah Goldberg. <laughs> and, and like if PewDiePie, he could do a he could do a, a, a podcast of him just farting and he would get 100,000 more subs than us. Just PewDiePie mm -hmm. farts. Is that yeah. that's not fair. It's definitely not fair. Yeah, not fair. it's. But just, you know, we need, I mean, are we, we going to have government, aren't fair? yeah, we're going to, we're going to have government step in and, you know, take PewDiePie yeah, off the air. Yeah. Tra and well, trashy books they do, right? that sell more than yours, Frank. Trashy books that outsell Hellbender. Oh yeah. yeah. Hellbender's <laughs> a killer book and they're outselling you. The yeah, whole yeah. world, it's, it's almost like the whole world isn't yeah. even close to fair anywhere. 
Yeah, but, I wrote like so, the, but the best idea, books. Though, right? Yeah, I wrote like yeah, the best books, and I've, I've read other books. They're not as good. I read um, other books are shitty. I've read a lot of them. They're terrible. Yeah, Brothers Karamazov. Not very yeah. funny. Laughed twice during that whole you know huge novel. <laughs> David Hume, all Jeez. straw men. A whole book of straw men. Huge <laughs> in history. He'll his work will out. People will remember his name forever, and and I will forever be anonymous. Just no one will ever know my work. <laughs> what about uh, all the, the money we have? I, I, I know dollars. your I know your work. I owned a Super Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah that's Still that with? makes me feel much better Frank <laughs> on the ash heap of history I made my dent I'm a real Melville <laughs> I, you, you got a Super Nintendo game uh, what about like I had three square meals a day and there's a bunch of Ethiopians dying right now of starvation and I got cable I think I'll watch I think I'll stream another I think I'll stream another movie well yeah it, it, it's and here's one of the biggest unfairness is me is uh, us versus our ancestors. Everybody, I mean, we we barely have to it's do true. anything, and we have like tons of food and everything. But everybody else, they used to like back in history, they used to work super hard, and you know they starved to death half the time. And you know, was that fair? Yeah, and all we do is judge them. Like yeah. we all we do is talk about how horrible people they were. Well, yeah, they were, they were. They, they were. built the entire foundation that we have to like rest on in our hammocks and sip our drinks and yeah they, they live our ipads yeah they lived in dire poverty poverty but they were like you know homophobes so they probably deserved it yeah how good could they be if they didn't <laughs> post on facebook you know a hundred times a day and make <laughs> yeah. make uh, killer burns to own the libs on twitter like i do a hundred a day <laughs> What's their contribution besides laying every brick of this house and this whole neighbor paved every street? I would never pave a street, by the way. <laughs> but I mean, that's the advantage. We get a we get to live on their hard work, and they got like no benefit from us, and we have all the benefit. It's not fair, but there's not anything you can do about it. And you just kind of. But we we should take the you know let's play devil's advocate here a bit because I think that the liberal uh, student who is the altruistic thinking that, you know, the government's going to solve everything or it would probably say that. Yeah. Like we said earlier, like we do have a certain goal to make things fair. Like we get in lines, we stand in line, we stop at stoplights. Like there's this stuff that we do to try to work towards fairness. Cause there is a, at least a courtesy and a politeness in trying to make things as fair as you can. Mm -hmm. And so why not have the government play in that and, and make that, happen why not even out salaries uh you know get everybody jobs why yeah, not because i don't because i don't want to work and i want to make money so the government's <laughs> a great solution for that uh to, to unleash that laziness in me and i'm not saying that about every welfare guys but you know there's people taking advantage there's always someone going to take advantage of a government trying to make things more equal and there's, right, because yeah, you know. and there's different types of unfairness. If you do all the work, but someone else gets half, that's not fair either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's it it is kind of a thing where you can't. It's almost the more you try to fix it, the worse it gets. Which you in in a microcosm, you can see how that even happens in the home. And I think a lot of these things, Jonah Goldberg says this a lot, that a lot of the principles that they want to apply in government, like communism stuff like that. It's stuff that works in the home with people that you love dearly and, you know, would sacrifice for. So like, you know, evening out the income, uh, the mo the wealthiest one in the house even sh spreads the wealth around. Yeah. All these principles, they work in a home with a family. But when it becomes a government of faceless people and then there's people at the top, inevitably, the people that's one thing to me I realized one day, a government that's going to make everything fair and equal requires an unfair group of unequal people at the top of all that, deciding where everything's spread out, what fair means, and they're by default not going to be equal and fair. They're going to be above it all. And so it doesn't work. It's impossible, which has, I, I think, been the point of this podcast. <laughs> I want government to make every job as dangerous as an underwater welder. <laughs> when when all when it's <laughs> equally <laughs> dangerous it <laughs> when it's equally dangerous to work the grill at Chick Fil A, as to be an underwater welder, 
then everything will be fair. Well, yeah, and that, no, that, no one <laughs> wants the bad side of fairness. It's like we always assume we're going to get more goodies when things yeah. get more fair. But the government's <laughs> going to go in like, okay, we got to make sure that everyone commits suicide at the same rate as white <laughs> heterosexual males. We figured out how to get it so that males can have half the periods. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, that, that, when yeah. people talk about fairness, they're always, you know, they want to match up on the good stuff. Like, never, they never say, like, we got to get women be half of workplace fatalities. Yeah. Or, <laughs> well, or even if we're talking about goodies, I want as much attention and free drinks as a hot uh, 27 year old woman walking into a bar. I, I should be able to get that. I can't help who my parents were. I'm a victim. So I well, want uh, her goodies. Oh, yeah. Well, that, there's a fairness you never usually hear people talk about. It's like whether you're attractive or not. I mean, that's a huge advantage yeah. in life, and there's nothing really you can do about it. Yeah, and, mean, it turns, and it turns attractive women psycho. That's, <laughs> that's another thing is like, in a way, getting all these freebies just ruins you. Like if you're born <laughs> into money or you're born into some kind of favor or something, um, you kind of grow up like mentally abused by everyone. Like hot women, they get – you know, they're, they get so trashed on, I think, by uh, homely people and picked up on by, uh, by men who only look at the outside that it's like they get carved into, into people who just like rely on their beauty or they have to get all these uh, facial surgeries to remain uh, young looking because it's all they have. They never had to develop character to get anything. You just walk in a room, be beautiful, man. Or, or if you're, you know, if you want to be a runway model, and you're a, a hot, beautiful uh, t- 24-year-old, or if you're a severe burn victim uh, uh, with born with flippers for arms, it just seems like uh, it, you're going to face some unfairness. Yeah. And I, I, I want to separate my opinion a bit from Doug here. I don't have anything against uh, hot women. <laughs> yeah, well, I think they're think, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just saying I don't have a problem with it. I just want their goodies. I'm not a hot woman, but I want all the favors for it to be equal. When are we going to break this glass ceiling against us homely me- old men? Yeah, fat guys. Yeah, look at the fat well, guys. He fat treats guy people fairness. worse than a fat a fat guy walks in. And We're still okay to make fun of <laughs> on movies. Hey, uh, so do you think opportunity – I mean – People that are obsessed with fairness, there seems to be like a scale, like the more uh, like the more luxury you have in your life, the more privileged you are, the more obsessed you're, you're able to be about fairness. And I wonder if there's that those people are taking uh, for granted opportunity, like the more opportunity you need, the less you care about fairness, the more you want opportunity, which opportunity in itself is unfair because everybody ha- it depends on who you are and what your talents are and all this stuff that, but if you've already got a bunch of opportunity you have a pretty good life then you can start worrying about fairness it's always the rich people and the stars on twitter who are talking about fairness because they've already got all their opportunity uh taken care of and they're not talking about spreading all their money around they're talking about everybody else spreading all their money around oh uh, yeah right. it's a big pastime like the sort of rich people who ran about the evils of rich people you know it's like uh <laughs> You know, like, uh, I like, you know, again, I come back, Elizabeth Warren, she always kind of irritated me as one of those. Uh, before her, was like a John Edwards is like super rich. And I was going about the yeah. two Americas. <laughs> it's yeah. like, whatever. But we'll, we're, when we get in power, we will save all of you. We'll reorganize everything. What if I'm not a very fu- funny writer and I want to work for the Babylon Bee? <laughs> yeah. We get a lot hey, of those. Is that a uh, we dig? get a lot of those emails. You get a lot of those, right? Yeah, <laughs> you've heard no, from a yeah. lot of those. Well, because it's weird because the Babylon Bee has a subscriber uh, feature because a lot of people want to submit headlines. So we created this feature where because people want to so badly, yeah. they're like, well, if you part of the feature of being a paid subscriber, it's a low price, but you can join a forum and you can pitch headlines, and we do look through it, and the ones that get voted up to the top, we'll check them out, and the people. Well, sometimes get, they make it through and they actually get published, but it is a little weird because you're paying to to write for us. But it's just that uh, it it kind of it, it's it's a compromise between us having to read all these emails for free and dig through all of them to try to find one good headline. Yeah, I got the solve. You just but we get do, people really do. mad. We get people really mad. They're like, I've submitted no, no. a gazillion headlines and not one has been published. Genius. <laughs> they, no, like, genius. We owe it you, to them. you keep the free submission on this side of the paywall. Just go straight into a trash. 
That's perfect. Yeah, that's a good idea. So everyone, they get their placebo of but, thinking. But that then it would be nothing but it would be nothing but trolls. The nice thing about the the pay is it we don't get a lot of abusive like mean people in there. It's a good idea. Not fair. Because what if I what <laughs> if I'm fair. a brilliant writer and I can't afford your subscript your low subscription? Most writers are pretty poor. Then you have to write an amazing headline in an email. And, and make sure it's the first, it's the opening sentence. So, because that's all we see generally when the email comes in. Yeah. The not not the six says, paragraphs hey, of what you says, meant hey, to I them for the last four years. I don't know if you guys take but dot, dot, dot. And then we're like, okay, next email. Because <laughs> right <laughs> now we just can't handle it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you get them, the pitches and they're almost always terrible. And you just, you don't know what to say. Well, that's what it's nice to say. Well, you can pay money to Babylon B and pitch your headlines. You know, they'll look at them. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's still, you're still in a sea of headlines, but less of a sea. Anyway, that's a side, that's a side note. So you're saying rich people so, are funnier. Check. So yeah, like there was the Patricia Ar- was it Patricia Arquette? Was that the one who like said the thing about, uh, I feel so bad about my whiteness and I just regret it. And, yeah. uh, I hate my whiteness and all this stuff. Or was it, Rose- did- is it Roseanne Arquette or Patty Arquette? Was it Roseanne it was Arquette? The, it was the one, Arquette? it was one in Pulp Fiction, right? The one with the. You know, it, well, yeah, it, she's it, in Natural Born Killers. It, really? Rich, it, rich people just oh, no. considered more trustworthy in general, aren't they? I mean, they have all this talk about you know, like assault rifles and stuff, but you can you can get like literal machine guns and stuff if you're rich and own them. You know, it's like we trust rich people with those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is weird. I I do I really do think there's a there's a thing with uh, it's a luxury. It, it really kind of is dawning on me. I mean, I've thought about it before, but just that. The obsession with fairness is a luxury. The wealthier we are, the more we want things to be fair. And it's not, it never applies to you. Wait, right. like you don't want everything you've worked for to suddenly be split up among everybody. Well, I mean, like, but you just look, like, we look across the pond at, at, uh, third world countries or whatever, and we go, it's not fair. It's sad. You are, you know, it's it, when you have this amount, but this much privilege and wealth. And they don't like you immediately feel bad about that. And you want something to be done about it. Well, yeah, it would be great if there was some power that could just fix it all. Yeah, we have we have like so much more opportunity than like 100 years ago, like advantages and technology. We've got little things in our pocket. We look up anything on and we mainly just whine. And it's, you know, it, <laughs> I mean, you think about someone, you know, from like, you know, hundreds of years ago. See what we do with all we have. They think that's really not fair. Yeah, I always find it's fascinating to me to try to. Like trace things back to like, you know, because we we got to, in all these ways and things we do and structures, they all started somewhere. It's like even the way that men and women are different. I mean, there's like, you know, if men were mostly out hunter gathering, you know, during when we were, you know, just living out in the in the forest and in caves and stuff, that just changed the social structure of what men were doing and what women were doing with their lives. And it and and over I mean, it's so recent that that women have, you know, had the freedom to have careers with birth it's, control and abortion. Well, yeah. Well, it's it, so recent that that's like even an option. So it, 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 you're it, looking at how that would have an effect. It, it's a weird thing because it, it's like, it, it almost seems anti-feminist because a lot of the bent is here's what men have been really good at for thousands of years, leaders, CEOs and stuff like that. Now, women need to do that and they're not 50 50 with you know in like the next 10 minutes then they need to feel bad yeah yeah like it makes when you think about that if really i mean by necessity women had to stay home and and take care of kids for you know 99.99 percent of history yeah and men were the ones out there like governments were created by them they were just making those decisions because someone had to and it's, it wasn't a sexist thing. It was just, that's just yeah. the structure of how things were. I read a thing on, like, we hate on women, why women suck. I read a thing on why women uh, often make better CEOs, by the way. It was, it had to do with men being so kind of impulsive and aggressive and competitive mm. that often they'll make bad corporate decisions and mm. they would bring a woman into the boardroom. And they would often make more uh, wise, careful, thoughtful decisions just because yeah. of their nature. That you can see how uh, 
you can see how you would naturally want uh, women in certain jobs because of their strengths. Not not just throw them in there because they they have a womb or whatever, but because mm-hmm. of their strengths and really monetize that to make a stronger uh, corporation. Just not not so much have them carrying people down, you know, being firemen and breaking <laughs> into buildings and trying to <laughs> lift a two hundred pound lift Ethan down the stairs. <laughs> I'm, I'm two hundred pounds, sweet. We'll yeah, that. maybe we should clarify too. This is a thing that happens to uh, Jordan Peterson often because he's always talking about hierarchies, and he's just saying they're a fact of life. Like he'll just make these examples and say that all over nature, all over everything, there's hierarchies. Like fairness is nowhere. Everywhere you look, there's a couple of this animal or these people at the very top, and ever and everyone else is just you know got the little bit. And uh, yeah. And he's not saying he likes it or that it's fair or that he supports it. And that's what we're saying. Like, we're not saying it's all, oh, we love it the way it is and everything's great and perfect. We're just trying to acknowledge that that unfairness is a fact of reality that we have to deal with and uh, do our best inside of it. But uh, and also and we're facing that reality that you. The more you try to fix it, the worse it gets. I think those are the two main things to understand because yeah. I think everybody acknowledges unfairness is there. It's what do we do about it is the big dividing line in our country. I think. Yeah. yeah government tend- won't make things more fair. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah. They, they tend to come at it with a tear things down sort of mentality. Well, you got people too high, bring them down. And that's, that's just makes everything worse for everybody. I mean, you can, can we think of some examples within our own in, actual examples in government that have, have been attempted uh, to make things more fair, Thomas Soul books have amazing lists of these things. But do you have you guys have any off the top of your head? Well, I know something I'm dealing with. I got four kids to, I got to pay for is, uh, you know, we we want more people to get into college because that's fair. So you have the government step in and fund that. And now we now that's going to cost, you know, uh, you know, now now all my uh, great great grandkids will be paying off my kids college loans. Yeah. So that's an example. If you're not impoverished enough, you don't get free college. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> our our daughter's trying to get into a college and was, you know, looking at financial aid because one year we made like twenty thousand dollars, then another year we made eight hundred thousand dollars. So we're trying to <laughs> like cook all the books to to make sure that that the application has our twenty K year instead of our eight hundred K year. Oh I remember I ran into trouble when I was into college because my dad had just been laid off, but he got a pretty nice severance, and so it oh, like man, a lot of so income. So he lost his job, <laughs> <laughs> but it looked like he had money. a lot of income. So, yeah, it probably is, and it's not. I think the thing that stops fairness that, that bothers me the most is when it stops being a meritocracy. Like, can you do the job? You know, you may not even be able to apply if you don't have a diploma. Mm-hmm. Let's say. And you may be really good at something. I'm looking at Thomas Soul quotes. This is just completely off topic. What you said. Oh yeah, and I'm, yeah. Uh, it's, this is almost his exclusive his topic. But uh, like he says, the first lesson of economics is scarcity. There's never enough of anything to fu- to fully satisfy all those who want it. The first lesson of politics is to disregard di- is to disregard the first lesson of economics. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that we especially get that in uh, the uh, medical stuff these days. No one wants to admit there's like, you know, you can't have, you know, absolutely everything for everybody. And at some point you're going to have scarcity. Mm -hmm. And maybe we're we're also what I don't get is kind of the, the thing that feels so deceptive and weird is where did we get the idea that. The government has that big of an effect on things because on our daily lives, as far as. Maybe I pay fine two percent more taxes, or I lost this write off, or you know where where's my big magic payout gonna come from? You know what I mean? Like, are we really gonna we're gonna drum up all these voters to make the giant change and make everything different when government is so bad at doing or making anything when they implement it, like you know Medicare, free medicine, or well, whatever, yeah, for government health care. Yeah, frustrates when people talk about inequality so they want greater taxes which is just taking money away from really rich people to give it an even richer energy the federal government that is even worse with money 
And it's like, how do you benefit mm-hmm. from that? I mean, they always, you know, they're going to spend the money whether they have it or not, as we've long learned. Yeah, that's the that's the smaller government principle too. Is that you'll always be better with money the closer you are to its source. Mm-hmm. So the closer you get down to the people, it'll always be spent better. Say by local schools or even uh, a homeschool credit or whatever, you'll have a more efficient expenditure. So you'll get more for that money than if you uh, have a giant government bureaucracy top down start throwing out checks. There's not as much, you can't have accountability at that size. So, I, yeah, and I know that we do have a few left leaning people that listen to this podcast, a little handful of them. So, this is our, we're defending ourselves. We aren't in, inhuman, we're not unhumane. I, we actually think, I know that I do, I actually think that more freedom is better for everybody than to try to even everything out. Yeah, it, yeah it, overall, and, uh, it doesn't make opportunity. It doesn't make things more even or more fair, but it makes it lifts everybody right. up. It just admits that unfairness is going to be there no matter what you try to do. It's not going to go away, and uh, we should all in our own lives be try to be fair and polite and good. But to try to do government mandates, there's just, it's just so complicated. It's it's it is really elevating government to a godlike status to think they could solve that problem. It's like asking the government to, you know, solve the sin condition or something. <laughs> yeah, and I don't remember Jesus walking around trying to make things fair. He's like, the poor will always be with you. It's true, yeah. yeah. Or, why, didn't he, why didn't he heal everybody? Or think of the parable of the, the workers that got paid different amounts throughout the day. Yeah. His parable for <laughs> yeah. grace. Oh, yeah. There, there, that was his response to fairness. It's like, yeah. Yeah, you got what you were promised. What are you complaining yeah, yeah, about? He, he got 10 times what you got. And am I not the boss? <laughs> That's a great <laughs> boy. Is that boy? Is that out of fashion now? That's mullet. <laughs> People can't even understand that. Well, and I think about that a lot with sin and fairness. Is we just, um, you know, our our natural instinct is to say cheer when justice is served against a um, you know someone of some egregious crime some kind of a real bloodbath or Bill Cosby or whatever. You're supposed to cheer about that. But then when I personally have my uh, smaller sin get forgiven by grace, I'm all about grace, grace, and forgiveness. And guys, let's move on. But about that guy over there, get him. Mm -hmm. Get him, string him up, and may he never find grace. I. You know, I, I, I'm uncomfortable celebrating anybody's death. I mean, even even as when they announced Osama bin Laden, it's like, you know, it just felt weird to cheer. But I, I, that's maybe more of a Christian perspective, you know, that is no, never anything really to celebrate. Yeah, I, I kind of cheered at Hitler's death, but it, it, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't account for grace is the thing. It doesn't yeah. account for forgiveness. And I always feel like we reduce Jesus's ability to forgive when we say we want justice for everything up to this sin and then every or we want forgiveness for everything up to this sin and then everything beyond that we will champion and shout for absolute you know vengeance mm-hmm. but really what it does is it says like Jesus's blood only pays for these lesser sins and those other ones are too big for him to pay for and forgive you know he's really thin on the forgiveness of murderers let's say and half the New Testament was written by Paul. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 is it fair that vengeance is the Lord's? Yeah. <laughs> and shouldn't we all divide it up? Well, yeah. it's uh, we're hitting about that time. We should switch to our other topic here. We're gonna we're gonna um, I don't know what we call this our department. That's what Mike usually calls it, but he's not here. We're gonna talk about. Uh, interaction. We're each going to share a story of an interaction with somebody famous. It doesn't matter what degree of fame could be minorly famous, could be massively famous, but uh, we're just going to name drop. So who wants to go first? You guys there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wait okay. for somebody else to go first. <laughs> I, the one that keeps coming to my mind is Ruth I Buzzy. I met Ruth what? Buzzy at, when I worked at Nickelodeon. Nice. She, so go? she was the old lady on Laugh-In, and she was uh, in Sid and Marty Croft's show, The uh, Lost Saucer. She was in it with Jim Neighbors. She played a, a robot person. 
And, uh, you know, this is when I'm in, I don't know, fifth grade or sixth grade or something. And, uh, I met her at Nickelodeon and she was doing a voice, you know, for a show. And I follow her on Twitter too. And, uh, I just love her. And she was very bubbly and smiling and generous. And when I told her, you know, about that Sid and Marty Croft show, I go, I saw you in the lost saucer. And she just laughed and giggled and smiled and, Oh, thank you. That's so nice. You remembered. And I love, uh, that celebrity meeting. <laughs> Well, I guess my best story, which is one I have told in the past, and that's meeting Nick Offerman for the first time. We met at the uh, Oinkster where you, you get these gigantic pastrami oh, yeah. sandwiches. We've eaten there. In, I ate there with Eagle you Rock. And, uh, Yeah, we used Eric. to eat there all the time. That yeah. was a, Eric, our, our mutual friend, um, had told me when, I, when he found out I was going to meet Nick Offerman uh, that he had read that Nick Offerman loves the Oinkster. So when Nick said to me, uh, invited to meet up i suggested the oinkster to be like hey yeah we like the same place and he, goes, he goes i hate that place yeah <laughs> <laughs> and eric was was razzing you no go ahead so he showed up in like this beanie like he was in disguise he was wearing this big thick jacket and a beanie but and he a still mu- had a mustache he had a mustache signature disguise. mustache yeah because he was still he was in the middle of doing his show so he had to have the mustache but when he doesn't do the show he doesn't have the mustache because he's trying to disguise himself <laughs> so he it was kind of funny because it was like a hot L.A. day and he's just dressed like he's some guy that came from the tundra because he's trying to like hide his identity or something. And uh, so we bought food. My, the only exciting, I mean, the kind of the, it's funny that he spilled mustard all over his pants. That's my, <laughs> that's all I got. And it's only that it's like, oh, whoa, he's not immortal. Nick Offerman's and, human. And just the look on people's faces because they it was really packed in there. And the table he sat at was really just a, like, you know, they have those tables where they just put some stuff in the middle and pretend like it's two tables, but really it's one big table. Yeah. So the other group was right next to us and we basically sat at their table and you saw the guy's faces and like when Nick sat there, like, holy cow, that's he, amazing. He's going, don't draw attention to yourself. Don't draw attention to yourself. The you mustard just goes all over his pants. Yeah. Ah. Did, did you ever accidentally ruin his anonymity? Like, hi, TV's Ron Swanson. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Good thing he didn't spill something bright and yellow all over himself to draw attention. <laughs> or just the fact that he was dressed like, just dressing like that, like, well, like all those clothes on in LA, like, you know, something's up. Like, what is it? Who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. In LA to blend in, he should have worn a dress. Yeah. There you go. Oh. <laughs> well, anyways, my, my uh, big celebrity encounter would be uh, Richard Dreyfus. I had a long political discussion with him. Oh, cool. uh, well, I worked. I worked at a production company, called Emergent Order, and he came uh, to like do some voice work. And uh, we had just a long discussion. I forget the name of the political principle. It's summed up by um, it's the hangman, not the state, that executes the prisoner. It's basically like you know, there's no American people. There's a bunch of individuals, so it's kind of nonsense. We say like the American people believe this. Everything's made up of a bunch of individual uh, choices, and he didn't really buy that. But uh, he, he's like a big believer in civics, inter- interesting. Like yeah. everybody needs to learn about civics, the founding of the country, and they know, uh, know more. The thing, though, I yeah, always I've seen him interviewed on that. He's like a constitutional expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was really, it was really refreshing to have like a, a celebrity kind of, you know, uh, obsessed with something like that, which I think is a bit more useful. And then, um, <laughs> then you know, environmentalism or whatever. Who cares about yeah, a celebrity that actually read a founding document? <laughs> yeah, he, there's probably there's probably two. <laughs> yeah, I remember there was some big ado where he like went to a Ted Cruz rally, which from actually meeting him seemed normal. He wants to, you knew that guy was running for president. He wanted to know about him. Well, everybody else like they freaked out about it. Uh, this is like during like 2015, 16. But anyway, the uh, uh, the thing I always remember though is like he was looking through our fridge at, at the office. And uh, he was so happy when he found uh, a, like, oh, Coca-Cola, because I always remember uh, like a thing about capitalism is how the rich and the poor, we all drink the same Coca-Cola. And, it, it, you know, that's really neat to see an illustration <laughs> of that. Like he's just as he's just as famous. People are just as happy to get a can of Coca-Cola as I am. It was the only thing <laughs> you guys had in common was Coke brought the <laughs> world together. They drink Coca-Cola and they spill mustard on their pants, on their pants, just like we mortals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have a new story possibly because uh, this weekend I'm going to get to sign books with Henry Winkler. Oh, oh awesome. the Fonz. Because <laughs> I drew his book and it became a New York Times bestseller this week. 
Hey. And they're signing in LA and he invited me to go sign with them. So. Have them sign me one that says Sid on it, Richie. We're probably not going to talk politics, though. I don't know. I'm assuming. Hey. I think of him more as Barry Zuckercorn from Arrested Development now. <laughs> yeah, I think of him as uh, uh, Frank Cousseau. Is that his name? From uh, the Barry, from Barry, Barry on HBO. It's a really good oh, show. I haven't, I haven't seen that. I, I hear everybody rave about it. Yeah, They'll always really be the Fawns to me from Happy Days. Yeah. Anyway, well. Thank you, Frank, for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'll uh, drop some links to Frank's many things in the uh, in the show notes. If anybody w- reads them, follow Frank on Twitter. Uh, give us some uh, right here. Give us your Twitter handle and whatever else you want people to <laughs> find out about. It's I M A O underscore. Okay. Long story. <laughs> That's my Twitter handle. Oh man, you don't <laughs> deserve to be followed by anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he has massive follows. I think Did you say you I M A O? It, it, it was my my blog, which I've mainly abandoned. It was called In My Arrogant Opinion. I M A O, and then because I M A O was taken by uh, some Korean person, I had to add an underscore. <laughs> <laughs> I M A O underscore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or search for Frank J Fleming. I'll pop up. Yeah. Just don't spell it with two M's. One M. <laughs> Frank Fleming. One M. And uh, by uh, Hell Hellbender is on Amazon. Would it be on Amazon? Yeah, it'd be on Amazon and Audible. There you go. Get Hellbender. Get it. All right, everybody. Until next time. This has been. Audio Molest.